Or is that your phone? We're here live with uh, Michael Wallach. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our very first uh, live broadcast. Uh, we're live on Facebook and Twitter. And um, my name is Ori Danieli. I'm the executive director at Technion Australia. And we've got a little bit of technical uh, issues, which we're hopefully going to resolve very quickly. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Technion is, you've got a... Um, You've got a comment line under the, uh, on Facebook, which is where you can ask questions. We're here to answer as many questions as we can. We also have a few questions people sent in advance, and, we, and Mike will make an effort to answer to the best of his ability uh, as many as we can. So get comfortable, and hopefully we can, uh, we can try and help out. So uh, Michael, sitting here with me, thank you for giving up your time. I know you're very, very busy. Yes. Michael is... Uh, is among uh, Australia's leading uh, authorities when it comes to um, infectious diseases. So we're, we're honored and privileged to have you with us. Uh, he's the director, the inaugural director of the Biotechnology and Infectious Diseases Center at UTS. He's also a director at Spark, which he'll talk about in a little while, which basically brings together uh, a group of uh, close to 30 uh, leading institutions that are, that are uh, dedicated to tackle some of the humanities medical and health greatest challenges and of course now there's a lot of emphasis into um, into COVID-19. So um, Michael. Yes. Hi. Hi. All right we've got uh, it's a it's a very challenging times that we're, we're facing obviously there's over 200,000 cases globally close to 9,000 people dead including a seventh announced here in in Australia. It's affecting 173 countries globally and um, before we go to, to our audience, perhaps if you could set the scene, give us a, a couple of uh, you know, best case scenario, worst case scenario, and most realistic scenario to what we can expect in the near and maybe not so near uh, future. Okay. <clears throat> so to put things in perspective for, for everyone, uh, up until this point, as terrible Keep going, keep going. Yeah. Up, up until this point, as terrible as things have been, um, the, uh, in comparison to what we witness every year with seasonal flu, we're still far below the types of levels of mortality and morbidity we see with influenza. Um, in, uh, in, in world numbers, uh, two years ago, we experienced a very major seasonal flu outbreak that led to over 600,000 deaths. Um, and uh, it's not to say that this is a good thing happening, but uh, unfortunately, just like flu happens seasonally, this is a virus that seems to be uh, coming up uh, more often uh, than we'd like. Um, a related virus, SARS, occurred in 2003, and uh, MERS occurred in 2012. Um, and this is something now that's going to be happening periodically. Um, the first thing and most important thing of all is to remain calm and not go into a state of fear and panic. That is definitely um, uh, our biggest challenge uh, that we're facing is our own fear and panic. We have to understand that these viruses exist in nature. Uh, they're out in uh, wildlife and birds and other types of animals and occasionally they transmit from wildlife to humans, um, and uh, we are experiencing the effect of that now. Our hope as scientists and immunologists is that this wave uh, will uh, come to an end, this first wave. We saw now in China the number of cases dropping down to below detectable. I don't know if it's zero. The Chinese just put out uh, uh, an announcement that they had zero cases today. But that's not to say the virus is gone, it's not to say now uh, it's over. But it is to say that things can be put under control through quarantine and social distancing so that we all get through this wave uh, of disease together. And the goal, as you've seen probably in the media, is that the goal is to flatten 
the peak of numbers of cases of uh, COVID-19 so that the health system can cope and um, then uh, keeping the mortality very low. In countries, in fact, like Germany, where there's been a, fair, a very large number of uh, infected people, the, number, the mortality level has stayed very low. Um, whereas in Italy, as we witness, it, uh, it became very problematic, largely because of a very uh, aged population and, um, and the medical health system there not being able to cope with uh, the numbers that quickly uh, came into hospitals. There's a sense actually amongst colleagues of mine, not my, myself alone, that uh, number one, that this isn't going to, hopefully not going to be uh, as bad as newspapers are projecting. Um, it's certainly um, causing a lot of havoc and it's very unpleasant, but um, the expectation is that in Australia, for example, we should do fairly well. Um, the government is handling it fairly well. This question mark over closing schools and closing universities now that they're facing, but they're facing it in a rational manner. Again, if we work out of fear and panic, we may do things that actually are harmful to our society. Um, in going into the future, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Brian Oliver from University of Technology, Sydney, where I also am, uh, a respiratory um, uh, expert said that um, we're going to probably have to uh, cope with the fact that like flu this virus will probably stay around maybe for a long time uh, but as we develop herd immunity uh, the hope and expectation is that the waves that may come in the future will be less dramatic. With all that said we have to accept the fact that we live in a world where there are dangerous in terms of viruses and other infectious diseases and uh, we have to now learn from this experience, face up to it together as a society and do our best to combat the effects of this terrible pandemic. Thank you, Michael. Let me just make a technical comment. We, we, this is the first time we're doing this and we're, we promise we will improve, but we had uh, some issues connecting to Zoom, so unfortunately uh, it's currently available on our uh, Twitter and Facebook account, and we'll work out to to, to perform better for you uh, next time. I just uh, on the same uh, topic, are we now? Do we now need to get used to having this sort of scale of outbreak every few years, every five, ten, fifteen years? Is this something that humanity just needs to learn to cope with, or is it a hopefully you know one in a hundred year event or something of that nature? Um, it's hard to predict, like for earthquakes and other natural disasters, when, when this will come and how often. What we do know, um, and I have been working on pandemic flu in the past, uh, is that, as I mentioned before, uh, these viruses uh, exist and coexist with us. Uh, coronaviruses, for example, cause colds and often uh, are very um, mild forms of disease. Um, and as I said, I think this experience can be a wake-up call to prepare ourselves for when the time comes and we're faced with a truly uh, even um, much worse type of pathogen um, that may come in the future. And what, we've learned, what we can learn from this is how to prepare ourselves. Um, that's the goal, is preparedness. Taiwan, for example, that went through uh, an experience with SARS learned from that experience and was very prepared uh, for this the numbers in Taiwan of infected people and certainly in mortality very very low so it's about preparedness it's about understanding that nature uh, keeps throwing curveballs at us and we have to be prepared to deal with them the worst thing again to do is to enter into a period of fear and panic to um, and not work together to not collaborate together that is more damaging, in fact, than the disease itself. Thank you. I think there's one thing that's spreading possibly faster than the disease, that's information, which is great in one respect, because we can, because our authorities and governments and schools and hospitals can keep us informed, but at the same time, there's a lot of inf information there that's uh, not necessarily, um, you know, comes from trusted sources, which is hard to, hard to relate to. But, so I have a question here from someone who wanted to stay anonymous, but does, 
uh, iodine-based gargle kill the coronavirus, and we've also seen a lot of posts whether salt water kills it, similar to when you have a throat ache. Uh, the best way to kill the virus is to maintain high levels of hygiene, washing hands with soap, uh, uh, using disinfectants. Um, once the virus enters the respiratory tract, it's difficult to kill it right now with anything. It, it uh, depends on how it enters our system. It could also enter through uh, rubbing our eyes, and in which case uh, using any type of mouthwash won't help. We have to be able to prevent it coming in through all uh, different ways of entering our body, our eyes, our nose, our mouth. Um, obviously, uh, when we touch surfaces that are contaminated and then touch our faces, uh, we transmit the virus. Um, the, um, the work going on now, and actually um, the um, best uh, approach is uh, probably through uh, vaccination, and that's what uh, we're all working on very, uh, very much and with great effort. So on that note, uh, I mentioned briefly earlier that, uh, that Michael is a director at uh, Spark, which is a consortium of leading institutions that are working on some uh, uh, groundbreaking research into, um, into vaccination and... Uh, many aspects. And, and many, could you share with us one or two that seems particularly promising as well as perhaps talk about time frames? When can we see it coming into action? Uh, so there are many, uh, many groups working on vaccines around the world. Uh, we have a consortium uh, based out of Stanford Medical School that's called uh, Spark and Spark Global. Uh, in fact, uh, there are now 23 countries and over 70 institutions uh, in our community. Uh, we have uh, regular meetings. We had one just a few days ago where we speak to each other from all over the world. Um, we're learning about uh, progress in our uh, various countries. Um, I'm, for example, leading a group here in Australia to come up with a vaccine approach um, and uh, talking, in fact, I'll talk tonight with a colleague in Taiwan who are developing a vaccine. Um, I'm also in touch with colleagues in the United States at Stanford, at uh, Johns Hopkins, where they're also working on, a, on two uh, approaches for vaccination. So. I would like to um, give the audience, first of all, a very optimistic view that we will get there. Uh, we're working really hard. Um, we, uh, the WHO, when they announce an 18-month period to get to a vaccine, uh, we're hoping to do it much sooner than that. Um, I can't make an announcement today on, a, on our success. We're getting results, uh, all of us around the world getting results as we speak. Um, and as soon as there's something that we can announce to the public from anyone, anywhere in the world, I will do so. Um, there was an early on announcement out of Israel by a company called Migal, uh, who claimed uh, that they can get to a vaccine within weeks. Um, that, in a sense, is true. One can produce vaccines in a short period of time, but there's a lot of time involved in um, testing the vaccine and making sure it's safe. Uh, and efficacious and getting FDA approval and everything else that goes with it. Um, the other thing I could mention which is really positive is that the FDA uh, is working with us as scientists as is the TGA uh, to um, do very rapid approvals of any new uh, potentially um, uh, useful vaccine. Thank you. We've got a question here from uh, Laura. She's a grandmother, and she was told to stay away from her grandchildren. And she's obviously, as a grandfather, I'm sure you can appreciate, as a very uh, tough challenge. Um, how serious as those uh, those requests, uh, and do we need to follow them? Um, so, in terms of children transmitting the disease, the basic concept right now is children, uh, as we're seeing. I get very mild, if at all, infections. Uh, a, pedi um, a, pa a pediatrician in the United States is now working with a test to see, in fact, how many children are getting infected. It's often hard to detect uh, children that are infected and potentially transmitting the virus. Um, obviously, for people who are elderly and have 
uh, complicating heart conditions, diabetes, or respiratory conditions, um, they should isolate and isolate also from children who may potentially transmit the virus unwittingly, where they have minimal or no symptoms. And at this point, it would be best um, to, uh, to isolate elderly people away from children where it's really hard to tell. Once we have a test that will be able to tell us whether a person who has no symptoms actually has gotten infected or mild, uh, that will be very helpful in, in preparing ourselves for the future. Thank you. So, uh, still on the on the topic of children, as we know, in many countries now they've uh, stopped uh, schools. They're discussing it here, but uh, still, uh, most schools are still open at this stage. Uh, there's criticism about Australia and other places that they perhaps were a bit late in their response. Do you think that uh, Australia is doing enough, or perhaps other uh, countries are overreacting to a certain extent? Because of course, we are. We all appreciate that there is. In addition, of course, health is the most important, but there is implications to the economy and to, to, to the social uh, environment. Uh, what's your views on that? All right, so there are pros and cons to the decision of uh, keeping kids in school or having them at home. Obviously, there's the effect it has on the parents and on their ability to work. Um, it has a huge effect on the children, um, and it has a huge effect on the teachers. Um, at this point in time, um, I think we're getting close to the point where, like the rest of the world, we're entering a, a, a more um, rapidly expanding phase of this viral infection, where we went from a period of what's called the seeding phase, which is sort of a lag phase, where you don't see too many um, people getting infected, and you enter a more exp exponential phase in numbers of cases, so we're probably getting close to the point where I would expect the government will decide to close the schools, but uh, they are um, trying to keep them open uh, long enough so that the impact on society isn't severe while they maintain a watch over the situation. But like uh, my university, UTS, uh, uh, surprisingly closed classes this week when they had not really uh, shown any um, readiness to do so, it, it could very well be at any specific time this week uh, uh, that suddenly there'll be an announcement that would not surprise me. Thank you. There's a question here from Alfredo who wants to know how are other uh, vaccines such or treatments that are used for other diseases such as HIV and um, you know flu, for example, how are they being tested and what's the, what's the potential of them assisting with this situation? <clears throat> so, um, flu and HIV are extremely different viruses to this coronavirus. Um, to give a bit of a short lesson on vaccinology, um, there are a number of uh, approaches to making vaccines. The, the first one, which is a more uh, a, um, old method, is just simply growing the um, virus in embryonated eggs, as they do with flu, isolating the virus and either attenuating it, heat killing it, um, or adding chemicals that will render it um, uh, very um, good at um, getting a, an immune response to it, but not causing disease. The approach being used by the company Migal in Israel and others in the US is uh, synthesizing and making uh, a portion of the virus that is not infective but can elicit an immune response. They actually synthesize what's called the messenger RNA that encodes the proteins that are on the surface of the virus that you've probably all seen pictures of. These proteins that help the virus attach to lung cells is called the spike protein. And one can theoretically um, synthesize what's called a messenger RNA that you inject into a person, enters their cells, makes this protein, and the body can react and uh, prevent um, infection by, by the virus. Um, the other method that a lot of people are working on is called passive immunization. Similarly, to use, is used for rabies vaccine, where we produce um, serum and antibodies um, that are already present um, in people's blood. Uh, and it can be raised also in animals. 
These uh, antibodies, sometimes we use what are called monoclonal antibodies that recognize a specific target that can block the virus. Uh, this is another approach that a lot of people are working on and um, have already announced uh, the uh, production of these antibodies. So we're basically getting together during this period an arsenal of vaccine approaches that when brought together and brought to bear on this virus, uh, we are confident and believe that we'll start to bring this uh, pandemic under control. Thank you. Uh, there's a question for Michelle here who wants to know how uh, much impact does the weather have or climate has? So, uh, as you know, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from Israel and my family are all waiting for summer to come to heal them, to, to take, to rescue them, but then they hear that it's affecting Australia in a pretty similar, if not worse, way. Um, how, how, how much impact does the uh, weather have on this situation? Yeah. Uh, so, indeed, the rest of the world is looking at Australia as an example where there was hope that um, to see Australia doing better than uh, other countries because we, this pandemic started when we were still in the summer months. Um, again, what we're seeing is Australia is not behaving that differently to other countries. Um, and, of course, we're starting to enter into a period of colder weather. Um, the worst thing for us to do as we enter this cold period is to stay indoors and lock ourselves in in groups uh, of, of or large groups larger than just a family. Uh, to, that helps transmit the virus. And in the summer months, the reason we don't transmit well is we're usually outside and we have social distancing. Um, we don't know at this point um, if climate has a major is a major factor. Um, there were uh, speculations that it was, but again, um, we're witnessing months, uh, we will have a relatively flattened curve in Australia. Uh, new drugs and new vaccines will come online, and we'll start to get this under control. Great. There's a question here about the um, uh, ethnical and uh, background. Does that have a different impact in terms of how it affects what are there communities who are more resilient? Yeah, so in the initial phases of this pandemic in China, um, it looked as if uh, the Chinese population was more susceptible. The rate of mortality was extremely high at the beginning, and then it came down very rapidly. But then, in speaking to colleagues at, in Taiwan, where um, uh, Taiwanese citizens returned from China, even from Wuhan, at the beginning of the pandemic, the Taiwanese were able to keep the pandemic under control, and there didn't seem to be any particular um, susceptibility of, um, of that population. At this point in time, the way the virus is spreading, it looks like it's pretty much infecting everyone in similar ways, and the greatest impact on how a given country gets through it is its preparedness, its uh, medical health system, and uh, its uh, coming together and working together effectively as, uh, again, evidence in countries like Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Uh, the hope is here in Australia, we'll do well because we have an excellent health system. Um, we took it seriously. In fact, Australia was the first country in the world to declare a pandemic. Um, and. Um, and uh, uh, I would just remain optimistic and calm that um, things will uh, get worse, but uh, again, not to enter into a period of panic and um, uh, keep an eye and watch on what the government tells us to do, follow instructions. If we're told not to uh, get into groups larger than 100 people, and we'll probably be soon told to not have more than 10 or 5 people together, then just follow the instructions. That is very important. Don't think because things are getting better, for example, or things are not getting worse, everything is going well. Just follow the instructions, and that's the best way to ensure that we get through this together. All right, there's a question. Uh, <clears throat> is there a pattern of developing of non-symptomatic uh, virus carriers? Um, that, again, is a question uh, people are looking into. The test that's required to pick up people who are non-symptomatic and are infected is a blood test that can detect 
antibodies against the virus um, in the blood of people who are asymptomatic. Um, that test should come online pretty soon. And um, there's work going on around the world um, where announcements have been made that that test should be available pretty soon. That will be extremely helpful for two reasons. We'll be able to identify people carrying the virus who don't have symptoms again. And also will give us an opportunity to assess the level of herd immunity that has developed. And by herd immunity, we mean a large portion of the population sooner or later is going to have to develop immunity against this virus, just like against flu, when pandemic flu occurred, and that's exactly what happened. And as herd immunity develops, the virus has certainly uh, is unable to continue to um, infect people, and uh, that in turn will lead to a very sharp reduction in the number of cases. On that note, on herd, uh, herd uh, community, there is a question here about countries that have, um, I guess, did not, have not been affected as much by the, by the virus, so hopefully will not in the near future as well. Are they, are they risking not, be, not developing their herd immunity in their community? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, China now uh, is in a state where they said, or announced that they don't detect any uh, cases. They're going to wait 14 more days, and this is in Wuhan, uh, to see if that uh, remains uh, the case. And then people will start uh, returning to, to work. Uh, similarly, in Taiwan, where the level of infection was very low, people are going to start going back to, to their lives. And then we'll be able to observe, do we see, again, a spike in numbers? Um, the hope is, again, um, that a larger number of people than we think uh, went through the infection actually did. Some uh, experts um, are predicting, epidemiologists, that about, we're picking up about 5% of the cases, or maybe even less. So, um, in most likelihood, the level of herd immunity we're developing is higher than we realize. And, um, and the virus, again, as we develop this immunity, will find it more difficult to continue to infect us. Thanks. I know you touched on it at the beginning a little bit, but this question comes up uh, uh, again here. Uh, people want to know how long should we expect to be isolated? When can we jump on the next plane to our holiday or work? I know it's something that even you as an expert can only uh, predict, predict to your best of ability, but if you can give us some realistic time frames of when life will go into relatively normal. Thanks. That is hard to predict and it may vary between country to country. Um, the countries that um, handled it very well um, are aiming to get back to normal life as soon as possible, but there is that fear that when they open up the international travel, uh, the virus will be brought back in, in large numbers, and then they'll have to isolate again. I think what we have to do is, again, look at this rationally and ask of ourselves that uh, the most important thing of all is the health of ourselves, our loved ones, and not to feel that we're now under pressure to get back to normal life. Rather, this is a period that we just have to be patient. We have to see how things develop. We have to bring online the tests that I already described to be able to, to assess what level of herd immunity has been achieved. And then scientifically and statistically and math mathematically, come to a conclusion, what is the way forward, and to start making announcements as to when we think we can start coming back to a normal life. So I think what I'm asking of everyone is to put health first. I know economics is a major issue, and I know we're all very uh, frightened by what we're seeing happening in the markets, and that's exactly because of this panic. We have to take you know, a deep breath to realize we're going through something now, um, we can't exactly predict when it will come to an end, but it will. We have to believe in the future, and we know that we're going to come out the other side, and we're going to come out stronger and better in the sense that we'll have learned a huge amount from what we're going through now. Thank you. A question here about, um, it's more of a comment or comment slash question 
And places where the where the detection is very low, is it because they're doing better to prevent it, or is it because there's less testing? Um, right. So. Um, as we've heard, testing has been an issue. I know in some countries, people who start showing symptoms who want to be tested often have to work, wait for very long periods of time. Um, the um, the uh, authorities, the health authorities now are ramping up and testing uh, is becoming um, more efficient um, in certain countries, not in all. Uh, and as I say, at the same time, testing to tell who's been sick, who's been not sick, um, who's, who's uh, likely uh, in the future to get, get infected. Because say, if you have very um, mild symptoms and you might not have noticed them, you may already be immune and you don't even know it, particularly children. So I think um, testing will um, play a huge role and continue to play a huge role and be able to help us detect new cases in the future as we come back into normal life again. But what is expected is there may be additional waves of this virus. We hope and, and expect that it will be milder waves in the future. And again, if we do enter additional waves of outbreak, we'll be better prepared. We'll have more tests available, more masks available and also prepare us for any pandemic in the future, which is probably the most important thing of all. Thank you. Jonathan is asking, uh, why don't we have a more robust tracking system over civilians? Privacy shouldn't be, um, should be sacrificed uh, to saving lives, shouldn't it? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, we live in a democratic society and we can't give up our principles uh, that we've cherished uh, all these centuries. Um, with that said, uh, the Australian government has uh, put in place for people who re return overseas in 14 days of isolation, that is a very heavy fine. Um, I don't know if we'll have drones flying over us telling us get off the street here, but it could happen. And within the I guess the limits of democratic life, um, I'm sure that we'll all be feeling uh, enough pressure to follow the rules. And again, that's one of the beautiful things about Australia. People do follow rules. There's a real spirit of, of being uh, a volunteerism in Australia. We have to go back to those roots, to those types of behaviors. And then there will be no need for somebody beating us over the head to say, stay at home and don't go outside. Um, I'm in fact uh, in semi-isolation myself now because I can't afford to get infected as I work on the vaccine. Um, and um, I'm trying to maintain distance and uh, behaving according to the principles that we've all been hearing from the government. So follow the rules and that will be fine. Thanks. There is a, a question slash comment here from David who says that we perhaps we are not uh, prepared as well as we should be. Is there a reason? Could we have been prepared better as society, as Australians, or as humanity in general? There's no question everyone could have been better prepared. Um, and that's true for many events, uh, natural events that occur uh, around us. Uh, and that's the wake-up call here in Australia with bushfires, floods, uh, storms, pandemics. This is a moment in time to reflect and say, yes, we have to prepare ourselves better. And the government, I'm sure, and all governments around the world will be learning lessons. The governments that did learn lessons from previous pandemics, like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and others, have actually done a very good job in controlling this one. And um, I think once we wake up to this uh, worldwide, the next time we experience this, we'll be much better prepared. Thank you. A question uh, from, um, from Leanne here about, has there been any studies done on people who actually recovered, who were sick and are now recovered? Yes, there are. And um, in the uh, period, uh, if, even after the Spanish flu, uh, research was done on the use of what's called convalescent serum. People who recover from infection produce an immune response that's highly protective and trying to use the antibodies from uh, their serum and blood 
to protect other individuals who have not yet experienced the infection. Uh, that's being put into place in the United States. I've been speaking with colleagues at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, who um, is, is one of the centers for this pandemic control. And in fact, convalescent serum from people who recover are being uh, put into use. And as I mentioned earlier, it will teach us which specific antibodies we will need uh, to be able to be useful to control uh, infections in uninfected people. Thank you. Uh, question here. Uh, which authority has the information over where people are infected? Um, you know, their names, their location, who tracks this, uh, this, it's a lot of data there, who tracks and controls it? I can't say I'm an expert in that area. <laughs> I'd be a bit guessing. Um, I would imagine that um, with uh, all the uh, AI available today, that community has been asked actually to come on board and play a big role in gathering data. Um, a call went out for the AI community to do that. Um, I expect that um, all governments will again start to do that even better than they have at the beginning. Certainly in Australia, I think tracking of people who are infected, yeah. finding them, telling us which flight number and which seat row they're in hmm. was very helpful. I think you heard that recently. Sure. Um, and I think, um, I think we'll continue to do a better job. Uh, and, and again, from all of this, as we go back and reflect on this, we'll be learning a great deal. Great, so there's, a, there's obviously, I can tell by the questions, there's a lot of parents there and they want to, want, they're asking you to go back to children and uh, further emphasize in terms of, the, are they, is it a possibility that they will be carriers, that can they infect others? How significant is the, is the risk? Uh, yeah. yeah, so research is being done on that as we speak. Um, there is an ability of children to transmit. It's at a low probability. If a child is showing no symptoms, the transmission is probably negligible, but it's not zero. And again, children uh, tend to be very um, touchy-feely, yeah. and that could make them more transmissible than they would be uh, if they were an adult. Um, there's a group in the States now who are studying uh, children and how many actually are get infected. Uh, the number so far that I, was quoted to me is under 3%. Yep. I don't know how accurate that was. That's uh, information I got yesterday or in the middle of the night mm -hmm. that we were told by a researcher in America that under 3% of children that he tested, I think it was somewhere in the western uh, state, um, in the U.S., um, it was under 3%. So, again, the chances of a child coming into contact with you and transmitting to you are low, yep. but they're not zero. Great. All right. I'll ask you now to, uh, we're going to wrap up the, this, uh, this uh, live uh, broadcast. As I mentioned, it's the first one. We know there were some glitches here, and we're going to improve on them. Um, just a few final uh, notes from you. Perhaps uh, you've been uh, very positive. There, was, uh, there were a few comments there, I'll tell you, that were saying, is it okay that we're so calm? Maybe we actually should be a bit more concerned and aware of things, and is, is that the right approach? But just uh, some final remarks of, uh, of uh, your, your thoughts. Thanks. Yeah, my, my final remark is remaining calm is beneficial no matter what's going to happen. There is no advantage of getting into a state of uh, uh, fear. With the same thing, it's becoming um, uh, not taking this seriously is equally bad. So if you see me as calm and I'm very much involved in this fight against this disease with many others, that's because we believe in the future and we believe in the ability of our health system, of the great scientists working in institutions together all over the world, of people, in spite of what we saw with toilet paper, of people now having enough toilet paper and feeling um, Okay, I have my toilet paper, now I'm ready. Yeah. Um, but in all seriousness, we, um, we're an amazing uh, society, an amazing world. Australia is amazing. We have some of the best places in the world. In fact, when I spoke to colleagues at Johns Hopkins, and I've said I'm working with colleagues at the Doherty Institute of the University of Melbourne, they said, well, actually, they can do even more things than we can. 
So we can be very proud of what's been developed here in Israel and the United States and just work together with a positive outlook. That's the best way to get through this. Terrific. Uh, we've got, uh, I'll just, uh, there's one last question that's actually quite interesting, but the usefulness of masks and gloves, people, if you can touch on that. So as you've heard uh, from even the Surgeon General of the US, masks are not very useful because you can simply touch your eye and transmit this virus. Um, it's useful if you already do have symptoms and you're afraid of spreading it to others. It doesn't certainly do any harm to wear a mask. Um, I'm not saying anyone who wears a mask take it off immediately if you feel more comfortable with it. Yeah. But don't expect it to protect you. Don't get a s false feeling of uh, security from it. Um, just. Uh, use it with the thinking that even if it doesn't protect you from coronavirus, it may be useful against other pathogens that may be in the air, particularly in cities like Beijing where the air pollution is so bad, and we experience a bit of that in Sydney. Yeah. Um, it may be useful in terms of preventing other things from getting into your lungs and keeping your lungs healthy. That's very important. Terrific. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, I'm just going to uh, wrap up here and say, unfortunately, due to the circumstances, we don't run physical events, and we're going to start running more uh, events of this nature. We will improve this way. I apologize in advance. We had some technical issues, which we will work on. Uh, hopefully, we'll have uh, Michael again with us in the uh, next week some, some time to give us a bit of an update. And we're also launching at Techno in Australia a new series called Science Strip Bear, which essentially is bringing scientists to you to explain uh, complex and deep science in an easy to understand way. So stay tuned. We'll be we'll be in touch with you. Thank you for uh, for being with us, and we'll broadcast this uh, this as well, so you can uh, we'll share it on our social media. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.